kids, uh, Krishna. So kids can go, Mataji will start the uh, kids program. So whoever uh, wants kids, they can see there, they can go and uh, join a Mataji. Radanga, Chairana Madhava. Radanga, Premarnava. Jaya, Radha, Madhava. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjali Hari Kunjali Hari Gopi Jana Balabha Giri Hari Jana Banda Bhagiri Buddha Jadi Divine Grace, Easy Bhakti Vedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada Ki Gaur Pimanandi. Oh, 
ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय That's Dhruva's mantra. We're beginning a series of discussions on the very famous, much loved, remembered, recited, revered section of Shrimad Bhagavatam. Uh, the description of the life of Dhruva Maharaj. It covers five chapters of Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4. And to put this topic into context, I think we'll go back to Canto 1. In Canto 1, chapter 13, it's uh, Dhritarashtra Quits Home. That's the title that Prabhupada gave the chapter. The very beginning of that chapter, it mentions that Vidura being insulted by Duryodhana, he left the royal palace, went on pilgrimage, met Maitreya, he became perfected in the process of the hearing and discussing with Maitreya and then came back to Hastinapur. Chapter 13, Canto 1. Chapter 1 of Canto 3, those who heard this description, the sages of Naimisharanya, headed by Shonaka, said, Way back in Canto 1, you mentioned this pilgrimage. Could you describe the places that he visited, Vidura, and this exchange between Vidura and Maitreya? They're both such exalted personalities. It must have been a really wonderful exchange. Could you describe that? And so Canto 3 opens with the pilgrimage of Vidura and then several things. He then meets Maitreya. And when he meets Maitreya, there's this wonderful exchange. Maitreya is a perf now perfected, before he was an exalted person, but Maitreya heard directly from Krishna. When Krishna spoke Uddhava Gita, Maitreya heard Uddhava Gita directly. So, between the two, Maitreya being a Brahmana and Vidura, by birth at least, Shudra, but an incarnation of Yamaraj, who in Hastinapur was revered as the most wise, except for Duryodhana, he didn't like his wisdom. So the, these, the, the two respect one another in appropriate way, and then Vidura places questions before Maitreya, and among the early questions, which are responded to over a course of several cantos, he asks about Lord Vishnu's creation. And a little different than what modern science and physics says, he describes the process of creation. It's one of the ten topics of the Bhagavatam, starting with Canto 3, Sarga, and then this Sarga. Visarga is the sub-creation, what Brahma does, because Brahma is created by Vishnu. 
and then Brahma creates the universe. But he not only creates the universe, he takes responsibility to fill up the universe with living entities of various species and various circumstances of life so that they can resume the karma that was in abeyance during cosmic annihilation. So several things happen and then the first of the Manus is born. The first of the Manus, this is Canto 3. Swayambhu Manu and Shatarupa and they come before Brahma who instructs them what their service is and they say yes sir and so to create Praja they have as children two sons and three daughters and one of those three daughters is detailed, Devahuti. And Devahuti and her marriage to Kardamamuni and what they did after marriage and nine daughters and Lord Kapila and the teachings of Lord Kapila. This is Canto 3, latter half of Canto 3. So we're still in this, and so now it's the third topic, the Manus and the descendants of Manus. It's one of the three topics, but it's told in this um, history format. So, uh, Canto 4, Chapter 8 is a continuation of the unfolding of creation. It's not unfolded yet completely. And it's not exactly chronological, but it is logical. Because we're, we'll hear in the beginning, tomorrow morning, we'll hear in the beginning of chapter eight about other creations from Brahma that took place chronologically much earlier. But um, then in this section, chapter 8 of Canto 4, another one of the children, one of the sons of Swayambhuva Manu is described. So remember there's two sons, Priyavrata and Uttanapada, and then the three daughters, Devahuti, Prasuti, and Akuti. So this is just putting everything in context, the Dhruva story. Dhruva becomes the son of Uttanapada. The elder brother, not always, almost always, the elder brother becomes the next king following his father. So Swayambhuva Manu's first son was Priyavrata and Priyavrata wasn't inclined to Kshatriya duties, he was inclined to going to the forest and perfecting his devotion in bhakti. So he made that request of his father, his father consented, and the younger brother became the king, Uttanapada. And Dhruva was the son of Uttanapada. So we're way at the very beginning, not just of Satya Yuga or the life of Manu, the very beginning of creation. The details of creation have not yet been unfolded very early. Some of it, but not all of it, is unfolded. So, Vishnu going down, Brahma, Svayambhuva Manu, Uttanapada, and Dhruva. Now, since Uttanapada and Devahuti are brother and sister. This means that Lord Kapila was his cousin. Just to put things in context. I mean, how'd you like to have Lord Kapila as your cousin? Your father's sister's son. 
did they meet? I don't know of any narration that said they did. I don't know of anyone that says they didn't. Who knows? That would be a nice chapter to add to the Srimad Bhagavatam, the meeting of Dhruva and... So, but the, the topic of hearing about Dhruva, we know this from Canto 1, Chapter 7. It's equally important as hearing the topics of the avatars of Vishnu, hearing the activities of a pure devotee carries with it the same spiritual potency because of that pure devotee's connection with Vishnu as the topics of Vishnu. Same potency, that's why it's in the Bhagavatam. So we're going to, th this evening, we're going to spend some time uh, just doing an overview before we actually be en enter into chapter 8 tomorrow morning. This illustration comes directly from Wikipedia. It's um, <coughs> Dhruva, we know of him largely as a child, but he became a king. He became a king and ruled for 36,000 years. It's, it's Satya Yuga, so that's certainly possible. And he's a perfected soul ruling as a king. And we'll hear something further in chapters about Dhruva as the king. So we'll, we'll start with this little introduction and I'm going to ask for volunteers, please raise your hand, don't just blurt it out. When you think of Dhruva Maharaj, what do you think of? If, if it's nice if you can say one word or a, a short phrase. What's pretty outstanding about Dhruva? Go ahead. Determination. Determination. Very good. The other evening, we got three determinations. Three people raised their hand at the same time. Very determined. So that's one of the sections, is determination. He teaches us, against all odds, determination. What else? Austerity. Austerity. That's another important section. Yes? Faith. Faith. Strong will. Strong minded. Strong will. Strong minded. Strong minded. Determination. Determination. Very strong. Very strong. Yes? Pure Louder? Pure devotion. Pure devotion. Pure devotion. Well, even more specifically, how to go from mixed to pure devotion. That's us, right? We may not be so determined <laughs> like Dhruva, but our, our uh, assignment and our circumstance is mixed devotion and how to go from mixed devotion to pure devotion. Okay, so in Canto for chapter 8, text number 8, Prabhupada lists six different benefits. Just hearing Dhruva's pastime, the time we'll spend together. Now it's not like there's only six, and he doesn't do one through six in the purport, but these are mentioned. They're benefits. Um, and the first that he mentions is detachment. Specifically, detachment from material possessions. And Prabhupada even comments, both gross and subtle material possessions. Now the possessions that 
Dhruva renounced, he renounced the kingdom. He walked away. He is the eldest son and he just walked. Like went to the forest and gave it up. It's a little more difficult to give up his material sense of possessiveness, but that came about by Shuddha Bhakti. And the graphics person that put all this together did a very nice job. So I asked them, what was their intention behind this image on the right side? And the image on the right side is a devotee that's offering everything to Krishna and then a non-devotee thief that's taking whatever they can to make it theirs. That's the material possessions person. And the devotee becomes detached from material possessions by offering possessions to Krishna. The detachment from material possessions, we're going to review these after we finish the six. I'm going to ask you to list them, so see if you can pay attention and get the A on your exam here. Detachment from material possessions. We recognize this image, watering the root of the tree nourishes all the parts of the tree. Um, the message Prabhupada writes is enhancement of one's devotional service by austerities and penances. So his are extreme and they're not to be imitated. We would die if we tried to imitate. But, and we'll hear about them as we go along, the austerities that he performed. And it was recommended. It was recommended three times. Recommended by his stepmother, recommended by his mother, recommended by Narada, and he did it. So for us, the application of austerities of body, mind, and words isn't, you know, doesn't look like what Dhruva did, but the principle, austerity of speech, it's right there in Bhagavad Gita chapter 17, text 15, austerity of speech, austerity of the body, austerity of the mind. There, there can be very simple, like, you know, a very simple one for us is a codice. Strictly follow a codice. How, how difficult is it? It's very mild, that austerity. No beans and grains, oh. <laughs> or no onions and garlic, oh. I met somebody in the course of my travels. I really struggle with onions and garlic. <laughs> I got everything else together, but I can't. So anyway. Our austerities are minor, but in principle, it's good. Rise early in the morning. Somebody just sent something to me, and I've been circulating a little bit. It's a four minute video, entirely from a science approach, that says what happens to the body if you take rest after 10 o'clock. And the short of it is, it's a mistake. For this, you know, just biological reasons. Just biological reasons. And getting up, four o'clock. That's six hours. Now some people need more than six hours, and some people get up much later than four o'clock. But this little video clip, it's a, it's, a, it's a science person narrating what happens at the cellular level and the neurological level and so forth and how the body becomes rested. It's the same thing my Ayurvedic doctor said. Here's what my Ayur same thing. Take rest. No later, any sleep after 10 o'clock is you, it, you have to sleep twice as much to feel rested. Better to take rest at nine o'clock. But 10 o'clock, that's it. Because otherwise you have to sleep more and you're still not feeling rested even if you sleep more. Just, so this little video clip. So that's an austerity of the body. 
but it, ha it's, it strengthens your whole system it, without details. So, enhancement of devotional service by austerities. So the first one is detachment from material possessions. You're just to review so we can let it go in. Enhancement of devotional service by austerities and penances. Here's what Dhruvas looked like. We'll hear some more. By the, by the fifth month, he had suspended the breathing process. Before that, he was taking one breath of air every 15 days. We can't do those things. But the whole of the universe had become suffocated. The mo movement of air in the whole universe was stopped. That's pretty serious. Very severe. But it, it, it enhances devotional service to accept. Here's it in Prabhupada. In, um, in the 60s, was visiting in Los Angeles and there was a recording of somebody reading chapter six, verse and purport, the entire chapter, and Prabhupada was stop, interrupt and speak something and then have them resume and so on. So at one point in chapter six, it's the perfection of yoga series, that's what it's called. Um, Prabhupada was speaking about determination, determination. Dhritavrata. How does one strengthen one's determination? It's on topic. So Prabhupada said, by voluntarily accepting austerities. He gave examples observing fast days of Lord Vishnu, half day fast, and observing of Kadasi carefully. It strengthens determination. That's the mind. By an action of the body, it helps the mind become more determined. You have to have a more determined mind to follow even really simple austerities. Okay. Enhancement of devotional service through austerities of the body and mind. So here's an image of a young fellow. He's reading how to know Krishna. And by that faithful absorption in how to know Krishna message, Krishna appears. The faith in Krishna, of course we don't see Dhruva doing lots of scripture study, but he is doing things that strengthen his faith. And we'll hear what are those things that he does and that happen in his life that strengthen his faith in Krishna. Remember, I'm gonna ask you what these six are. It's just a high school quiz, it's okay, don't worry. Elevation to the transcendental platform of devotional service. Well, he started from mixed, like, you know, kind of way down there, mixed, devotion. Devotion, mixed. And then elevation to devotional service that was pure. Prabhupada makes mention more than once in connection with the Druva story. This important verse um, from the Upanishad, Svetasvatara Upanishad. Let's say it together. Yasya Deve Para Bhaktir Tata Deve Tata Garau Tasyaite Katitaryartha Prakashante Mahatmanaha so, both Guru and Krishna, uh, the person who has devotion to Guru, as much as he has devotion to Krishna, the meaning of the scriptures become revealed. So, Dhruva becomes, he hasn't gone to school, he's a very young boy, but he becomes knowledgeable in the wisdom of all the Vedas by his strong faith in Narada and in Vishnu. Everything becomes revealed to him. 
commenting on this is Madhva's comment from the Vedanta Sutra or Brahma Sutra shown here. Bhakti brings one to the Lord and shows the Lord, which is in this next image. Um, according to Rupa Goswami, that form which Dhruva saw, it's a nice painting, huh? That form which Dhruva saw is Prishnikarbha. It's a lengthy explanation that he gives in Lagu Bhagavatamrita. Of course, he's knowing, but he refers to scripture to verify what he's knowing without the detail of the scriptural steps that he takes. This is Satya Yuga. And we know from Krishna's appearance in the prison house of Kamsa, Krishna says to Vasudeva and Devaki, you were my parents in three previous births. And it started with Suttapa and Krishna. You underwent great austerities. That's Satya Yuga. And I came before you and said, I will appear as your son three times. And I appeared as Prishnigarbha, and then Vamana, and who? Vamana was the son of Aditi and Kashyapa. So the second, then Krishna. So with this reference, there's more. We'll see more as we go along. Rupa Goswami confirms that is the form that he saw, Prishnigarbha. Okay, so five and six, connection and experience of the personality of Godhead. That is, Krishna appears. And he appears because of the affection, net nature of him. He felt affection for uh, this little boy, Dhruva as Narada felt affection, as his mother felt affection. He is the recipient of affection. And the, the fruit of that uh, affection was Lord Vishnu appeared before him, directly, personally. And just by hearing this, this is the sixth item. Maybe we'll ask you, whatever order you can remember them in. Hearing about a pure devotee, inspires the feelings of wishing to achieve pure devotion. You know, it's the gold standard, and when we hear about the gold standard, there's, there's potency in, in that sound vibration that inspires, generates a feeling to achieve that. Now, maybe I won't ask you for a repeat. Well, which, which of the six can you remember? You don't have to get them all. Any, just any one. Benefits? Detachment from material possessions. Gross and subtle. Austerities. Could, Austerities. Could, Austerities. But could you say the whole sentence? Um, Austerities en enhance the performance of your devotional service. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, helpful in developing a personal relationship. This is a nice one I like. Just hearing about Dhruva, it, it generates or awakens that already existing aspiration for pure devotional service. The, the experience with, of Krishna is direct. It's not just an intellectual phenomenon. Okay, so I have, I spent a lot of hours, like a lot, a lot of time in this Druva story and, and immersed in it. There are a couple that I found particularly nice and wanted to share with you also. Just two of them. Um, in Krishna's teachings to Uddhava, it's commented 
this is the statement by Krishna, only by bhakti with full faith, that was one of the messages that we heard, faith, only by bhakti with full faith can the devotee obtain me. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur puts in his commentary, this is shown in the histories of Dhruva and Palat. So these two Dhruva and Palat narrations are very popular, well known, repeated, loved, and very meaningful for us. Bhaktyaham ekaya grayaha. Here's another. Um, the image is Dhruva getting on the Vaikuntha Vimana. This comes in the last chapter. Dhruva goes home. And specifically, there's a few verses that describe. He didn't leave behind a material body and manifested his spiritual swarup, his spiritual form. His body became fully spiritualized. It was luminous like the sun, and that is what ascended the Vaikuntha Vimana. So what, like the Pandavas is described, they went to Krishna in their self-same bodies. The body can become fully spiritualized. So, by association, this is quoting our acharyas, by the association of bhakti, like a touchstone, the body made of the three gunas becomes free of the three gunas. These pure bhakti has that potency. <coughs> and, <coughs> In that spiritualized form, Nirva went back to Godhead. He achieved liberation in his spiritual form. And uh, Jiva Goswami comments that this liberation, mukti, in the case of Dhruva at least, does not mean sayuja. He uses the word dasya. That doesn't necessarily mean that his relationship is dasya rasa, but it's a mood of service as opposed to a mood of merging. And to confirm, he quotes this uh, Padma Purana verse, the wise say that liberation means following Vishnu. So we achieve liberation. The serving Vishnu mood. The meaning of the name Dhruva, they're all related, but in different places it's translated in different ways. The unchanging or supreme truth is the meaning of his name. The unchanging truth or supreme truth. The permanent, this word Dhruva is found in chapter 18, Bhagavad Gita. Similar, that which doesn't change, or the permanent. Eternal. His abode is Dhruva Loka. And fixed, so Dhruva Loka fixes the movements of all the other planets. We're going to hear some more in the final chapter. I learned a lot of things in, in preparation for this um, seminar. According to, I'll share one of those. According to uh, Jyotisha scriptures, as well as the Puranas, exactly as Prabhupada describes, they say, Dhruva Loka is in the upper region of the vertical dimension of our universe. Below Dhruva Loka are the planets of the Sapta Rishis, now the Sapta Rishis, these are sons of Brahma, but Dhruva Loka is above the Sapta Rishi planets <coughs> and the heavenly regions. And they're all, like we circumambulate Tulsi Devi, keeping the right side to Tulsi Devi. 
So they, um, they circumambulate, it, it's a vertical dimension, so they're lower, but they're circumambulating Dhruva Loka, keeping Dhruva to the right. And what keeps them in place, according to the scriptures, is there's a Sanskrit term, but it's strands of air, vayu, that like hold them, and as Dhruva turns, they turn. That's their circ circumambulation motion. It's air. Now, th th so that means in space, which is akash, it's one of the five elements, there's another element. Of course, there's other elements too, like the planets themselves. There are other elements besides akash. But in that akash, there are strands of air that extend from Dhruvaloka. And those strands are like ropes that as Dhruva turns, the air turns, and the planets turn. And that's the description of the motions of the stars in the sky, or the planets in, in our uh, solar system. Interesting. But everything is fixed on Dhruva. Um, in the cultivation of devotional service, very much relevant to us is this starting position of mixed devotion. Every one of us, ha most probably, have some mix, a desire for Krishna and desire for something that's not for Krishna. It's not like necessarily sinful, but it's not a desire that's for Krishna's pleasure, mixed devotion. And we're targeting going to this nice position of pure devotion. And in between where we are and where we want to go, there's some obstacles. And mainly there's stuff inside, not things outside. Because things outside are just a representation of what's inside. So what are some of the obstacles or blocks or external, personal, whatever obstacles that are between us and pure devotional service. And it could be in relationships to the holy name or some devotees, relationships that are troublesome for us or struggles with some part of your service, whatever that might be. Getting up when the alarm clock goes off, maybe that's one of them whatever it is. And by hearing about Dhruva, what is it that you hope or potentially can be achieved by hearing about Dhruva or receiving from Dhruva's determination, Dhruva's faith, Dhruva's fixed standard of attaining shelter, To hear some comment about Dhruva from Prabhupada, this is from, I believe, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Generally, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya, generally people come into the association of devotees to mitigate some material wants. But the influence of a pure devotee frees a man from all material desires by enabling him to relish the taste of devotional service. Devotional service is so nice and pure that it purifies the devotee and he forgets all material ambitions as soon as he engages fully in the transcendental loving service of Krishna. A practical example is Dhruva Maharaj who wanted something material from Krishna and therefore engaged in devotional service. When the Lord appeared before Dhruva as four-armed, four-handed Vishnu, Dhruva told him, my dear Lord, because I engage in your devotional service with great austerity and penances, I am now seeing you, whom even 
great demigods and sages have difficulty seeing. Now I am pleased and all my desires are satisfied. I do not want anything else. I was searching for some broken glass. But instead I have found a great and valuable gem. Thus Dhruva Maharaj expressed his full satisfaction and refused to ask anything from the Lord. Prabhupada about Dhruva. Uh, our Acharyas commonly refer to the Dhruva story as the example, the exemplary model of Artarti, those that want wealth, four types of pious people come to Krishna, and one of them is the Artarti, and that's Dhruva. Dhruva wanted wealth, wealth specifically in the form of a kingdom, because the kingdom rep represented that, that attainment. But he went beyond that artarti hankering. Just a few more references that I found meaningful. Uh, in Srimad Bhagavatam, we find this nice verse, the residence of Jambu Dweep, chapter 19 of Canto 5, say, Whenever Krishna is requested to fulfill one's desires, he undoubtedly does so, but he does not award anything which, after being enjoyed, will cause one to petition him again and again to fulfill further desires. When one has other desires, but engages in the Lord's service, Krishna forcibly gives one shelter at his lotus feet where one will forget all other desires. So make sure you hit the target. That's Krishna's lotus feet, that's the target. And then other desires, Anya Abhilash, become Shunya. And um, in his commentary, Jiva Goswami's commentary on the Sudama story, similarly, Dhruva is mentioned. You know this Sudama Brahman story? Everyone knows. Dear friend of Krishna, classmate. And when he grew up, uh, he uh, went to visit Krishna. To a devotee, who lacks spiritual insight, the Supreme Lord will not grant wonderful opulences of this world, kingly power and material assets. Indeed, in his infinite wisdom, the unborn Lord well knows how the intoxication of pride can cause the downfall of the wealthy. So note in the, in the verse, this is Shukadeva Goswami speaking. Um, it specifies the devotee who lacks spiritual insight. Now there are devotees that don't lack spiritual insight. So that's what Jiva Goswami is going to comment. Since the Lord is full of all powers, Bhagavan, and is always perfect in himself, Ajaha, he is independent in bestowing. He does not give wealth, kingdom, and power because of the variety of mentalities of the devotees. The Lord sees that intoxication with wealth, kingdom, and power causes downfall from one's position or make one fall from one's dharma to hell, since the Lord's is omniscient. Question, then why did he give opulences to Dhruva, Prahlad, and Ambarish? 
The answer, they had good intelligence. They had all good qualities because of the strength of their intelligence. But the Lord does not give to those with meager intelligence because he sees it will create obstacles to attaining him. So Dhruva got, he got more than he was asking. He got his father's kingdom for 36,000 years and he got Dhruva Loka which was like a pipe dream. But he achieved it beyond his, what anybody is normally could achieve. So he has this bodhi, this spiritual intelligence, but he gained it through receiving it from Krishna. How do you get spiritual intelligence? Krishna gives it. The dami bodhi yogam tam. That this, so it's, the Purana is a history that's demonstrating the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita's message. There's a very similar to what we see here in the Dhruva pastime in relation to Prahlad. Some of you may remember the last seminar we had, we covered Prahlad's prayers and the final section of his prayers is chapter 10. Canto 7, where Prahlad says, O oh my Lord, when a human being is able to give up all material desires in his mind, he becomes eligible to possess wealth and opulence like yours, which is what happened for Prahlad, and it's what happened for Dhruva. Opulence is like yours, that's the opulence of Aikunta. It far surpasses heaven. One becomes eligible. He, both Dhruva and Prahlad didn't want. Both of them got. Not because they wanted, but because they were capable of not being overwhelmed by opulence to manage it nicely or to offer it to Krishna nicely. One more reference is found in the 11th canto in the early section. The, the painting displayed here, that's the Navayogendras. These are nine of the 100 sons of Rishabdev that became Uttama Adhikari Bhaktas. They became perfected souls on the same level as Narada They had this power, yogic power. They could travel anywhere in the universe at will without an airplane, without a passport, without a, they didn't even have a vena. They just traveled wherever they wanted to travel. Kamaras had similar capacity. So where would they, why would they go anywhere? They had nothing to fulfill. They were being by super soul directed to situations where they could give transcendental knowledge. So they came to a place where King Nimi, pictured here, was performing a yagya. There in the front, there's the brahmanas, there's his ministers, an assembly. And as the yagya was, ab as the yagya was about to begin, Descending from the sky were the Navayogendras. The Yagya stopped, everyone stood up. Maharaj Nimi received them. I don't know who you are, but you're obviously effulgent, and I have some questions. And he presented a number of questions, and the questions and answers constitute this early section of Canto 11. One of them is this verse, text 40 spoken by Antariksha to the, to the king. When one seriously engages in the devotional service of the personality of Godhead, fixing the Lord's lotus feet within one's heart as the only goal of life, one can destroy the 
innumerable impure desires large within the lodged within the heart as a result of one's previous fruitive work within the three modes of material nature when the heart is thus purified one can directly perceive both the Supreme Lord and oneself as transcendental entities thus one becomes perfect in spiritual understanding through direct experience just as one can directly experience the sunshine through normal healthy vision there's similar verses in the Bhagavatam just by the bhakti process one can directly experience the Supreme Lord just like by eating when after fasting you can experience certain things that verse Here's Vishwanath's commentary on that verse from Canto 11, Chapter 3. The perfect stage of devotional service indicated in this verse, 11, 3, 40, can be observed in the activities of such great devotees as Dhruva Maharaj. <coughs> Dhruva Maharaj approached the personality of Godhead desiring a political adjustment on the material platform but when purified by chanting the holy name of God Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya he felt no further need for material sense gratification as stated in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam Janiyatiyashu Vairagyam very nice verse Chapter 2. Bhakti has the power to generate knowledge and detachment, or knowledge and detachment naturally arise in the heart of one who engages in devotional service to Krishna. So that happened in Dhruva's case. Previously, strong material desire, but as Bhakti awakened stronger, 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 that material desire became slackened and the need for material sense gratification was gone. So he comments, as soon as one advances in devotional service, one is freed from the embarrassment of superficial material desires. And he was literally embarrassed. He was feeling very sad and ashamed that he was approaching for some material desire. But he really had strong material desire. That's, that was his impetus to begin with. This is a reference Prabhupada makes to the Dhruva Maharaj story. The history of Dhruva Maharaj illustrates the purifying power of Krishna consciousness. Dhruva sought out the Supreme Lord as a way to obtain a material kingdom. But after he had performed severe austerities, and came face to face with Lord Vishnu, he declared something that you, those of you who like to hear Prabhupada recorded lectures, you know this phrase because he would say it over and over. Swamin katarto smi varam nayache. Swamin katarto smi varam nayache. Quoted in Chaitanya Charitamrita. My dear Lord, I am fully satisfied. I do not ask from you any benediction for material sense gratification. It's found in Hari Bhakti Sodagaya. It's quoted by King Kurushekar in his Mukunda Malastotra, and it's found all over the place in. Um, relation to narrations of Dhruva's story. 
Swamin Katar Tosmi Varam Niyache Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his associates similarly they liked very much hearing the Dhruva story we find in Chaitanya Bhagwat that um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would hear from Gadadhar Pandit daily Srimad Bhagavatam and he attentively heard topics of Prahlad and Dhruva Dhruva's cultivation of devotional service from the mouth of Gadadhar hundreds of times and hundreds of times and hundreds of times so we've all heard the story many times but it's the nature of Srimad Bhagavatam by hearing again and again the sweetness of the topics becomes appreciated in new and different ways again and again. It's like making sandalwood paste. Anyone that's made sandalwood paste knows what I'm speaking about. It just takes three things, well four things. It takes a piece of sound of wood maybe the size of your fist a flat rock and a little water and a circular motion while you chant Hare Krishna or sing your favorite bhajan or recite your favorite slokas or remember in Krishna in some way through sound vibration and as you continue doing and doing not too much water not too little just the right little bit little bit the wood turns into a paste and the paste becomes very fragrant. Now it's there in the wood, but you don't smell that fragrance until you start making the sandalwood paste. And then when you apply the sandalwood paste, it has a very cooling effect, especially in the hot weather. Very nice. So cooling, soothing, very fragrant Srimad Bhagavatam, similarly, is by hearing again and again and again and again, and again and again and the section concludes chapter 12 where the great sage Maitreya recommended one should chant the character and activities of Dhruva Maharaj both in the morning and in the evening so it's evening but we'll start again tomorrow morning with great attention and care in a society of brahmanas or twice born persons here is Prabhupada last section I'm going to read from taken from the teachings of Queen Kunti when Dhruva Maharaj was undergoing penance and meditating on the form of Vishnu within his heart the Vishnu form suddenly disappeared and his meditation broke. Upon opening his eyes, Dhruva Maharaj immediately saw Vishnu before him. Like Dhruva Maharaj, we should always think of Krishna. And when we attain perfection, we shall see Krishna before us. This is the process. We should not be too hasty. We should wait for the mature time. There's a whole section just on that statement. Of course, it is good to be eager to see Krishna, but we should not become discouraged if we do not see him immediately. So here's the, the family tree. This and one more slide and we're done. So, down here in the lower left, that's Dhruva. And just above Dhruva, that's his mother. And by her side is Uttanapada. And Uttanapada is, Priyavrata was one brother and three sisters. And they're sons and daughters of Swayamuvamanu and Shatarupa, who are directly produced from the body of Lord Brahma. So that's the family tree. And over here is 
Uttanapada's second wife, Suruchi, and his stepbrother, Uttama. So all these personalities, most of these personalities are mentioned multiple times in the course of this um, narration. Priyavrata is practically, in the, and the other daughters are not mentioned much, but the others are mentioned again repeatedly. So it's good to have a picture in your mind, that's why this chart, to show the family tree. Who, who, how does it all fit together? Here's a, an image of the temple where Dhruva achieved darshan of Lord Vishnu. It's at the top of Dhruvatila in Mahavan in Vrindavan. And in the middle, that's Lord Vishnu Little Dhruva is over here and holding his Veena over here, that's Narada. So, some of you may have visited this place and um, at least through sound vibration we'll be visiting. So there's the introduction to the Dhruva Maharaj topic. Want to hit the lights? See if there's some discussion. Krishna, if we give up material desire, then Krishna will do what? Uh, give opulence and wealth. Opulence and wealth. Well, can I elaborate a little bit? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not exactly give up material desire but transform the material desire into a spiritual desire. Now there's some material desires that we do need to give up because they're unwholesome. But otherwise, <coughs> desire is concomitant with the soul and so to go from material to spiritual desire requires making Krishna the beneficiary of whatever it is that you're desiring or the object of receiving whatever it is that one desires. So that's the bhakti process. So in the, the bhakti process, is, 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 it's, there's a whole panorama of what the bhakti process is, but in simple words, the object of the senses are extended to by the senses in order to offer the object of the senses in sacrifice to Vishnu. So that's, that's a simple definition of the bhakti process. And, and that way material desires become spiritualized. And in the course of offering things to Krishna, there's some things that are just not offerable and so they, we leave them to the side. And we can leave, it's possible to leave them to the side to the degree that there is a satisfaction that comes from offering offerable things to Krishna. One loses an attraction for the unofferable things, the impure things. Now, you want to add something? You're holding the microphone like you want to add something. Maharaj, about the point on uh, offering the sense objects, like the senses attract the sense object and then 
Uh, well, the, the, they're attracted in the in enjoying spirit. And it's, the problem is not being attracted to the objects. Let's just take, you know, the deities. Or let's take Kirtan. Or let's take Srimad Bhagavatam. I was trying to set up a, a call with somebody and it was getting delayed because of our schedule, their schedule. So I finally said, I'm preparing for this seminar. I'm gonna to have to wait till after the weekend. They said, oh, Srimad Bhagavatam, I love Srimad Bhagavatam. So, some people like literature. And you just c connect that love for literature with Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's out of this world. It's, it's not that the desire for being attracted to nice literature is a desire you have to get rid of. So it's just connecting those things that are, according to our guna and karma, we connect well with. And the object is, should be Krishna. I, 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 uh, I heard just, my thought is going to Badahari <laughs> on this topic. I didn't know because he doesn't talk about himself, but one time his wife did. Kosharupa was saying, um, Badahari was a graduate of a um, music school. He was an outstanding musician in his music school. And as soon as he graduated, he was part of a group that went on tour for some number of months all over Europe and all over the place. And they ha they, he was on his path to become a renowned musician, or you know, at least you know, a well-established musician in the world. And he's sitting there, you know, taking his prasadam while she's telling his story. And when he came back from this European tour, he stopped at the L.A. Temple, excuse me, he, he went through the L.A. airport and he received a book. And when he got home, he read the book. The next day, he went to the temple. And the day after that, he joined the temple. Those are the early days. And, you know, from then on, it's been his attraction for music is in his system. It's part of his psychophysical nature, but it just connected to Krishna and took off. And it's still there in him, the music. You know, he, he does, I don't know if you've heard, the, the, he has some studio recordings that he's done in Alachua, I assume. And they're really amazing. You know, the musicality is just amazing. But he shared with me once, generally devotees like the, the live recording, you know, spontaneous kirtan thing. And it's not as refined as a, a studio recording is refined with sound, microphones, that, you know, the orchestration of different instruments. And he likes that. But he knows the devotees like it. So, it's just connecting. You don't have to give up a desire. You have to connect that desire and the, the objects and the senses to Krishna and glorification of Krishna. You now that's easy, easily, easy to say. And it's another thing to do. There's the devils in the details of how we do that because tendency is doing things that you like is you do it because you like. And then it doesn't move from sense gratification to transcendence. But so that the, the essence is to do that, perform your prescribed duty and always think of me. Mama Nusmara Yujita. It's the remembrance of Krishna part and for the pleasure of Krishna is how you can always remember him. That's the bhakti part. Rishikena Rishikesha Sevana. But that's the, describing the principle, and the application of the principle varies from person to person. Dwaita Chandra, you've got something? You've got that look in your face. Like you, got, you want to say something? 
I really like the Jiva Goswami's quote there on why Krishna gave Oblin Samari Maharaj Pranav Dhruva. So I was just thinking about it. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> you had that impression. Okay. Thank you. Well, I, I like specifically, and so therefore I made it in really big letters. He, he not only had intelligence, but resting upon the intelligence was good qualities. So, bhakti, are, from bhakti arises good qualities, and bhakti requires good intelligence. So Krishna gives the good intelligence, and then comes the good qualities. But before it was like anger and revenge, and that's not a good quality. He was advised multiple times, don't, and he couldn't. But Bhakti did it, and he went on the other side. Good quality. Yes? Hare Krishna. Um, so I was trying to think, um, how should we approach hearing uh, about Guru Maharaj? passing uh, proper consciousness um, because I think, at least in my case, even between Sunday to Wednesday, Sunday I was very really eager and today there to be some kind of drop. Uh, so, in, in Dhruva Maharaj's case, he didn't have many distractions in the sense. He uh, didn't have many? Dis dis distractions. He was in a forest and, and he was yeah, focused on full-time, that was a full-time job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, here... Uh, do you think you could do that? <laughs> and therefore you're doing what you can do. But the principle still applies. So, how do you apply the principle in a distracted environment? That's your question? That's your question? And then also the consciousness in which we have to develop to hear about it. And also the consciousness that we have to develop when hearing his pastime? That's your question? Well, it's very simple. The second part is simple. It's receiving through sound. And the operative principle to hear effectively is a heart that's open. It goes like this. I'm down here. Dhruva's up there. I know I'm not up there. I know I'm down here. But I'd like to receive from Dhruva and the, the narration, the sound vibration, because it's the sound vibration of pure devotion. It's the same with the, with the Prahlad story. The Prahlad story is saying, Prabhupada writes that Krishna sent Prahlad to teach the way of pure devotional service. He sent him from Vaikuntha to this realm to teach us the way of pure devotional service. So just by hearing about Prahlad and hearing about Dhruva, we're understanding the way and within that sound vibration there's potency of pure devotion. So here in the receiving mood, I'm down here, they're way up there. Let me hear the sound vibration so I can transition from where I am to towards where they are. Because within the receiving mode, that vibration has that potency. So just turn your receiver on. And you know, it's, it's a desire. I want to connect with more with pure devotion and less with the mixed devotion position that I'm in. I'd like to tr go from where I am to this higher consciousness place. Here in that mood. And here and again and here and again and here again. And here and again and here and again and here and again and here and again. It, it's like cleaning a dirty pot. This is a little sharing. When I 
became uh, the, the, the first temple that I lived in was the Boston Temple. It's a, I can, it's a long story, but I'll make it short. I was told that Prabhupada said, by cleaning the pot, you're cleaning your heart. And I was a college upstart. A smarty pants college kid thinking, I'm so smart, why do they, they have me washing pots? Pride. But Krishna didn't like pride. He wanted me to become a bhaktanat, a proud college kid. So I washed the pots and washed the pots and then I figured, gosh, I better get into the mood of washing the pots like Prabhupada said. Cleanse my heart. And eventually, well, there's more detail, but I felt there was a, there was a change. And it has some, so it's, that's again and again, and it, you know, it took a, about a month of washing pots, you know, from where I, th what I was thinking about who I am to thinking about who I should be thinking who I am. An instrument of Krishna's service, that's all. It's a nice position. So, that has something to do with the distraction. The distraction, the world that we're in is, there's so many objects out there to, to be the enjoyer of. One of, the, one of the colleges that I visited, the, 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 the club president during question and answer session, University of Georgia, Athens, you know. So she said, could you give some advice to millennials that grew up where there's abundant technology and how do we handle ourselves in this abundant technology atmosphere without being distracted? I mean, that's just like one of many, but you know, that was, that was the same or similar question. Principle at least same. And <clears throat> so the answer is, starts with uh, moderation and then seeking to know who you really are. So you can't just like chuck it because it, it, it's not sustainable. Impulsive, radical, something or other isn't going to work. It's, it's just going to go right back to where it was or worse. So. It's in moderation. You regulate. It's like Prabhupada saying when they, the, the devotees would come early and they were addicted to cigarette smoking. So Prabhupada said, smoke one in the morning and one in the evening. <laughs> but who smokes in the morning? But anyway, regulate. And in the context of moderation, then in regulation, you awaken bhakti, and through bhakti, when she, as, as, you know, in response to your question, in this place of distraction, who are you in the deeper sense? Not just what your psychophysical nature is, because that you can study and read Bhagavad Gita and study your own nature and find out my nature is like this. In a deeper sense, who are you? So as that deeper sense of who you are awakens, then you, your intelligence becomes clearer and you can decide how much of technology or things that are out there are going to be beneficial. You accept things that are beneficial and you leave to the side things that are not beneficial. that are just simply distractions. And, you know, pick, pick ones that are going to be easier for you to do without. And leave the ones that are more challenging for later, after you've had a few successes down at the lower, low-hanging fruit ones. And you, then you go up. And bhakti becomes stronger and clearer, and intelligence stronger and clearer. And you, so, bhakti rises. And then the strength and the intelligence to not
be distracted in the world of distraction. So use technology and use things in a moderated way, in a reasonable way that's beneficial and try to minimize just distraction stuff, brain numbing stuff. contaminating stuff. Just stay away from the toxic and go towards the healthy. And cultivate bhakti. So you know, we have our four regular principles and do those. And little austerities like Prabhupada recommended so your determination becomes stronger. A taste for something. Maybe it's reading, maybe it's chanting, maybe it's kirtan, maybe it's washing pots. I know some people that's like their favorite thing. You know, corporate people, they really look forward to going to the kitchen and washing pots because they feel something. They feel the purification from their pride. It, it, it hurts. Pride is painful actually. Some people like serving prasadam. Whatever it is, do something that gives you a spiritual happiness. Do it a, do it a good amount. Let your bhakti grow. In the back. Thank you so much. I have a question on uh, is Dhruva Loka in material realm or in spiritual realm? Spiritual realm in the material universe. Is, is that okay? That's not. Is, should I explain that one? Yes? Okay. Here's the best way that I can think to explain it. You're in an airplane, and the stewardess lady says, fasten your seatbelt because we're going to take off, and all these other announcements. So you're in the, in the plane, okay, we're next in line, and you're going down the runway, zoom, zoom, zoom. And you're on the ground. And then enough speed and aerodynamics, and you're, now you're in the air, or not on the ground anymore. And you keep going to higher altitude and you pass through the clouds. And you look to the left and look to the right and you can't see anything except clouds going by the window. And then you get above the clouds. You're in the sky, above the clouds. You look down, there's the clouds. So, while you're in the clouds, are you in the sky or in the clouds? Well, you're in the sky and the clouds are in the sky, so you're in the sky. But you don't see the sky because you're seeing the clouds. Similarly, right now, we're in the spiritual sky. We don't see the spiritual sky because we're only seeing the clouds. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. We're not seeing Akash. Although we're in the sky, we're in the spiritual sky. Not even just, you know, the material sky. We're in the spiritual sky right now. But we're identifying with the temporary. So this universe is a temporary thing. Now you see it, now you don't. But in, in the midst of that material universe, there's a spiritual planet. The abode of Vishnu. That's where Dhruva Loka is. And when this universe is destroyed, that's not destroyed. It's not created or destroyed. It's like the soul is eternal. Vishnu is eternal. The abode of Vishnu is eternal. Where Dhruva went is to that place. And everything is circumambulating that place. And then it'll stop circumambulating when it's like withdrawn. 
cosmic annihilation. That's going to remain. So it's a spiritual planet within this material universe. Is that okay? Okay, I think we're done. It's um, 8 o'clock. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Jai.